We're going to finish up now. It's a collaboration between Norway and uh, Australia. Dr. Claire Thythian and Dr. Peter Windsor. And the paper is on sarcosystosis. So Claire has been injured. I don't know what, how it happened, but she's going to have to sit down. And uh, so... So thanks very much for the introduction. As I said, my name's Claire Fithian. I'm a British sheep vet. I'm currently working at NMBU in southwest Norway. And uh, I like to get around. So this uh, presentation is regarding a cross-cultural uh, mobility exchange with Australia. And I had the fortune back in 2013 to visit the University of Sydney and uh, had some discussions with the Tasmanian government. And what it seems that in Tasmania, and for those of you who haven't been visited, it's the, what looks to be a small, but it isn't, a small island uh, below Australia in the red on the graph. Um, it uh, has had historical problems with sarcocystes lesions in their slaughter sheep. And we had discussions with the local uh, government and the local abattoir or slaughterhouse. They have received increasing reports of these lesions in their sheep. Uh, just to remind you, it's a uh, protozoa, a uh, parasite. There are four species of sarcocystes that are associated with disease in sheep, two of which are associated with um, microscopic lesions and the clinical disease, and those that are associated with the macroscopic lesions, so the lesion that we'd see on meat inspection, they are S. gigantica and S. medusiformis. And the typical uh, mature uh, lesions, the cysts, look similar to rice grains. There are little white rice grains that you may be able to see on the, on the screen there. And they follow the, the direction of the muscle fibres. Now, it's an important for the industry because this is a source of wastage of sheep meat that could otherwise be entering the human food chain. So carcasses may be rejected if they are heavily contaminated or may be trimmed. And obviously, that incurs extra time and costs for the, the local abattoir or slaughters. Just to recap the life cycle here, so let's assume, um, if we use this screen over here, bigger one, we've got our, a sheep that's infected with macroscopic lesions, the cysts, sarcocystes cysts. And the micros macroscopic lesions are associated with a cat-sheep life cycle. So we have our infected sheep, our cat comes along and scavenges, so many of these, these sheep are managed in large flocks, it's relatively easy for them to be left on the pasture for some, some time. Uh, the sheep uh, carcass is scavenged by the cat. The cat then passes out those who sit on the pasture, ready for another sheep to be infected. And it takes approximately, it's, it's rare, it's between 10 to 14 months, but approximately a year before we see those cysts in the, in the meat. So at meat inspection, it is incredibly common worldwide to see uh, sarcocystes lesions in sheep. Um, it's not only our domestic cats, but uh, feral cats in particular in Tasmania play an important contribution to the life cycle here. So it was a very simple aim here, and that was to use uh, retrospective uh, analysis of routinely collected post-mortem meat inspection to estimate the prevalence of those macroscopic lesions. So very simple and clear aim there. Um, I'm very fortunate um, Animal Health Australia maintain what's known as the National Sheep Health Monitoring Scheme. And this has been pla in place since 2009 and offers a system where all abattoirs across Australia record uh, specific endemic diseases of sheep. Those include sarcocystes, other diseases such as uh, cagus lymphadenitis and paratuberculosis. The data that I had access to courtesy of Animal Health Australia was this September 2017 to June 2013 data. It contained only data regarding Tasmanian adult slaughter sheep and informed me of the number that were inspected and killed, the date of the inspection, and these sheep come in batches or lines, if you will, the category of age um, and sex. There was an abattoir identity code and the area that these sheep come from also was identified. So again, very simple. My um, aims for analysis were to estimate the prevalence, uh, and I determined that over the number total number inspected rather than the total number killed. Uh, a mean line prevalence, that's to say across these nine slaughterhouses that we had data from, um, if you were going to go to a particular abattoir, what was 
the predictive prevalence of in a batch of sheep. And there was some regression modeling as well to look at this effect of season and year, for example. So the results were that um, 3,571 adult sheep were submitted for slaughter. Of those, 91.6% underwent uh, inspection. So there were a number that were rejected prior to post-mortem meat inspection um, at anti-mortem, for example, examination. Now these lines of sheep, the batches of sheep that came to slaughter, they either came direct to the slaughterhouse from the farm, they came from the uh, cell yards, or they came as what's known as boxed or indirect. So they were batches of sheep that could be mixed from different farms. Most of the batches of sheep, most of the lines were recorded as mixed age and mixed gender. And so the results, the prevalence is uh, illustrated in the graph um, just over a year. And I'd just like to highlight that 2007 and 2013, they represent incomplete uh, years. So it's not a full year of recording. So over the, the period of surveillance of the data I have, it's an, a mean of 14.3% prevalence of sarcocystes. And that's really not dissimilar to what we've seen elsewhere. It's published, for example, in, in Spain, the last survey published on meat inspection there was around 12%, so we're not too dissimilar. But what you can clearly see from this graph is that 2007, 2008, it's almost as if sarcocystes wasn't there, reminding that this is what's recorded in the, in the slaughterhouse. And we skip to 2009 to just 15%. So the National Health Monitoring Scheme came into place in the 2009, so it's very likely that this represents the introduction of this, this disease on, on their scheme. You can see there's a little bit of variation, and it obviously increases up to uh, just over 23% in 2011. So as well as seeing differences over the years, there's obviously annual prevalence differences. Also, we want to look at the difference if, your if the Tasmanian sheep were slaughtered in different states. So sometimes the sheep would stay within the state of Tasmania. Other times they would be transported to the mainland, and the vast majority were either slaughtered and inspected in Tasmania or Victoria. There's just 887 in South Australia state. Again, if you break it down by state, I don't need to do any sort of fancy uh, statistical modeling here. It's pretty clear that there are uh, relatively huge state differences um, in that data there. Comparing, so you've got 2.4 compared to 40%. And if I break it down to an abattoir identity, there were nine abattoirs in total, nine slaughterhouses in total that were contributing to this data. Over half the population was slaughtered at abattoir A. And I just want to highlight the mean line sarcocystes prevalence, so the predictive prevalence if you were assessed at abattoir A, for example, compared to B, C to I. Yeah. So abattoir A, you've got 0.7. And if I compare it to the abattoirs C, G, and H, you can very clearly see if you were going to be assessed at these abattoirs, you were very much likely to have a higher uh, line prevalence of sarcocystes. The other thing that was interesting was that this data came with some identification um, that was unknown to me, but uh, the codes there were of particular areas that were uh, relative to uh, districts in Tasmania. And what was really interesting is those that came without the code, uh, that it was recorded as unknown, for example, or they came in through a different jurisdiction, then they had um, much higher levels of sarcocystes compared to those where we had the actual known district area. Uh, perhaps not unsurprisingly, that given the nature of the sarcocystes uh, macroscopic cysts, we know that they take some time to develop. So it's probably not unsurprising that those sheep that are over two years old that we find there's a higher level of sarcocystes compared to younger sheep. So my interpretation of this data, I said I had a very simple and clear aim, um, was that clearly these microscopic lesions do remain in industry for, for Tasmanian sheep industry. And there are clear uh, and significant differences between abattoirs. Now, obviously, this is a data set that was provided to me. I have no uh, background. I have no... Uh, uh, opportunity to go and visit all the abattoirs and find out everything about their recording practices. And I have to obviously clearly state there's some limitations to the data. There's, these are estimates based on observed, or we should say recorded, registrations of lesions. 
there may well be some sampling bias. Is it that certain sheep that in certain properties or in certain areas of Tasmania are sent to specific abattoirs on the mainland? I think a big factor for me is the unknown nature of the registration systems that occur and the line speeds. So we know that if batches of sheep are going through very, very fast on the line, then the quality, the ability to register lesions dramatically decreases. I have no information about the meat inspectors and auditing and reliability and sensitivity. They're all very important um, questions. Uh, I can't give you any information on that because I don't, don't have that. And what I'm particularly interested in is do these, what are likely to be registration, registration distances as opposed to observed differences, do these relate to the different abattoirs having uh, different categories or different tiers? For example, does the domestic abattoir that supplies locally, do they record in the same manner? Do they record every case of sarcosystes? Or do those records just represent those cases that they actually have to condemn the whole carcass? That may be a very simple uh, reason, but uh, as yet, that, that remains unknown. So I totally accept that uh, there are some limitations, but I think that um, abattoir surveillance data such as this does offer us um, a real tool for research and extension, and that's very much my uh, goal is working on the farms to use this abattoir feedback data in terms of preventative health management. For me, this uh, highlights the clear need for auditing of meat inspection, not just the uh, procedures and the protocols, but also the registration, so there's systematic and standardised ways if we're going to compare the data. Um, there's options here for targeted disease surveillance, so maybe taking some samples and actually assessing when we record sarcocystes, is it actually sarcocystes? And that would require more um, uh, research and sort of molecular tools such as PCR, for example. I think it might be useful to inform other risks to um, diseases uh, of sheep. What is really lacking at the moment is a, a, a quantifiable um, impact of sarcocystes to the industry. It's clearly having an impact, but how much to the individual farm and to the industry? And I think that would be very useful to actually target the resources and funding. One thing that to me springs to mind is that, that sarcosystes shares some similarities with toxoplasma, for which we do have T. gondii, we have vaccination uh, strategies available. We don't have um, the same for sarcosystes, we don't have the same amount of information on the immune, immunity that's uh, associated with sarcosystes. So it's potentially, a, is it a candidate for vaccination? I think the question that remains, we, there's still further work to be done. The economic impact, I'm sure, will drive further research. If I've not, uh, if you've not learned anything else from this lecture, I hope that you um, can see the benefits of a cross-cultural exchange. And I, I would just like to introduce you to the World Universities Network, um, the name. WUN, uh, it does offer a source of funding for people like myself, clinicians and researchers to uh, attend other institutes. Uh, it was invaluable for me to learn, it was very much a learning experience and to share experiences with others. So um, I've not just come up with lots of photographs but lots of new uh, research contacts and networks. So hugely um, grateful to uh, my colleagues at Bristol for firstly giving me the uh, good reference to, to apply but I'm hugely indebted to Professor Peter Windsor at the University of Sydney, who gave me what was a fantastic welcome to Australia, but a really specific and tailored uh, research placement to his colleagues, Sabrina and Steve, also. I must thank Bruce and Rowena, who were still in Tasmania, working on uh, biosecurity Tasmania and weren't able to attend, and to Tasmanian Quality Mix, who has stimulated these discussions. And lastly, I can't go without thanking Animal Health Australia, who have been incredibly open with sharing this data so freely. Lastly, I'd just like to thank you for listening, and thanks very much. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> thank you very much, Claire. Um, it's an interesting subject area. I'm sure there's going to be a few questions. Please. Thank you. Pia Presno from University of Bristol. I was just wondering if you know how many of the um, rejections were localised and how many were generalised? Because obviously if you're just chucking away a small part, it's not as bad as the whole sheep. Yeah, that's a really great question. It's actually not recorded in the current database, so all it reco gets recorded is, is a case of sarcosystes. And that was really my point, is that a case of sarcosystes for one abattoir might be 
they reject the whole carcass, or it may be localized, and that might be the reason why we're finding such significant difference between 0.7 and 40%. So great question. I would say it's all down to registrations, and it's, as yet, it's a bit of an unknown quantity it needs further investigation. One more question. Yeah. I'm Seamus from, from Australia. Uh, is your study uh, good enough to start a, a cat culling program immediately? <laughs> First of all, I have to say I am uh, just uh, doing retrospective analysis of what's already there. I don't think the data actually supports that. W what it's saying is that there is still an issue with sarcocystes in Tasmania, but there are clear differences that need investigating. So I absolutely couldn't support a cat culling. I know that there's uh, the Cat Management Act 2009, uh, which gives the right to uh, landowners and farmers to remove the cats or to return to the owners or to youth humanely uh, euthanize them. Uh, but this data certainly can't support um, that kind of strategy. It can inform certainly more extension, more farm tracebacks, uh, and more molecular work, absolutely. Okay, I think we're going to draw to a close. I'd like to thank everyone who spoke today. I'd like to thank all of you who came. It occurs to me that this is a really big forum for young vets, young veterinary scientists, and it can be quite intimidating. And there's many of them that are using English. It is not their first language. So it needs to be said, they've been really, really impressive, these people today. Uh, so I really want to thank them. You know, it's been an excellent session. Thank you, and I hope that you'll enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much.